Um, so I want to, so I'm um, an algebraic number theorist and I work on the Langlands program. And the Langlands program um, is sort of a network of conjectures that's trying to build connections between different areas of mathematics. So one very famous example um, is the statement that all elliptic curves are modular. And so elliptic curves, you can think of them as objects, sort of number theoretic or arithmetic objects. So let's take an elliptic curve, E over Q. So that's going to be a proper smooth curve of genus 1. And up to removing a point at infinity, it's going to be given by a polynomial equation, such as, let's take, for example, this one. All right, so this is our number theoretic object. And then modular forms sort of live in a different world, in the world of harmonic analysis. So they are holomorphic functions on the upper half plane that satisfy many symmetries. Um, so I'll just say holomorphic functions on the upper half complex plane. And I won't give the precise formula, so probably you've seen, well, some of you have seen it. Um, and one of these symmetries uh, allows us to write these down in terms of Fourier expansions. So if I take q to be e to the 2 pi i z, then uh, say a cusp form, which is a special kind of modular form that uh, vanishes when you go to uh, imaginary part of z goes to infinity, um, can be written as a power series in q. So let's take, for example, the following one. So n equals 1 to infinity, 1 minus q to the n squared, 1 minus q to the 11n squared. So if you expand it out, it's a power series in q. And it turns out, so don't worry too much about it if you don't know what this means, but this is sort of a weight 2 and level gamma 0, 11. And this gamma 0, 11 is a sort of congruent subgroup that specifies exactly what kind of symmetries this particular modular form satisfies. All right, so these are our two worlds. and it turns out that you can connect them. Um, and really, the objects that connect them are Galois representations. So um, there's a way to construct a Galois representation from the elliptic curve E. And let me just briefly describe how you would do this. So you can take the p to the n torsion points on your elliptic curve. So if you just think about it, like the underlying complex curve, well, you know, it's a Riemann surface. It's, in fact, a torus. And the p to the n torsion points on the torus are just abstractly isomorphic to z mod p to the n z squared. So you have something like this. And so if you were to take an inverse limit of these things, what you get is um, sort of something roughly like uh, the p adic numbers, a two-dimensional uh, or a module of rank 2 over the p adic numbers. But just think of it as an inverse limit as n goes to infinity of the p to the n torsion points. But it turns out, so there's more structure on this object than just this. So if you just think about the underlying complex geometry, then you get this. But when you try to find p to the n torsion points, so you have uh, you know, a group law on your elliptic curve, and you try to see what points are killed by multiplication by p. It turns out what you have to do is write down equations. Um, and those equations will have rational coefficients. And when you solve equations with rational coefficients, you get algebraic numbers. And so the torsion points are algebraic numbers, and therefore they have a lot of symmetries. Like solutions to polynomial equations have a lot of symmetries. And so it turns out that this has an action, maybe I'll just say this has an action of a very large Galois group the absolute Galois group of q bar over q. But you can just sort of think of this as an inverse limit of the Galois groups of any finite extension of q, so um, you know, any number field. And so this will be a big profinite set that looks like a torus set. Um, and your elliptic curve produces a two-dimensional representation of that Galois group. So rho e is just a two-dimensional Galois representation. And just as a comment, 
um, this sort of structure um, is a special case of a more general machinery that was developed by Grothendieck, and that's called etal cohomology. And that will take the will take any algebraic variety, say defined over a number field, and produce a Galois representation roughly on its Betty or singular cohomology. All right, so that's how you would get this. And then I said that these two objects are joined by uh, Galois representation. So it turns out it's also possible to take your um, modular form and produce a Galois representation. And in this case, uh, this was done by Deline, and the process is much more complicated than what I described for the elliptic curve. So I'm not going to say very much about it, uh, just that it's possible to also um, construct a Galois representation attached to a modular form. And then the sort of famous statement that elliptic curves are modular is the statement that you know, the Galois representation of this elliptic curve is isomorphic to the Galois representation coming from a modular form. Um, and this sounds like an abstract statement, but it can be made precise by sort of, what you can do is take this power series and expand it. So it's going to be a sum from uh, 1 to infinity of a n q to the n. And the Fourier coefficients are the ans, the Fourier coefficients at for corresponding to prime numbers, the APs um, are going to be related in a very precise fashion to the num number of solutions to this equation uh, being um, equal to congruent to zero modulo that same prime number. So this is something that can be made very precise. Sorry. And of course, this is a celebrated theorem and has many consequences. So one consequence in one direction is uh, Fermat's last theorem, but in the other direction, so I want to talk more about the other direction. And so the fact that you start with F and you can attach to it a Galois representation um, implies that F satisfies the Ramanujan conjecture. So this is something that I can make. And this is also uh, was proved by Deline as well. It turns out it's a consequence of the Vey conjectures. So you can prove something about a tall cohomology for a general proper smooth variety over a, fi a finite field. And that will tell you something, you know, using this relationship, that will tell you something about um, what this Galois representation looks like or about what the Fourier coefficient looks like. So the statement is that if you look at AP, then the absolute value of AP is strictly less than 2 square root of P. All right. Um, so this is the picture uh, concerning elliptic curves and modular forms. This is the picture uh, for sort of the two-dimensional case of the Langlands correspondence. And so it turns out that there are uh, generalizations that have been studied for many years. And so something that has taken maybe about 20 years of work is sort of generalizations is understanding some sort of special case of modular forms or cusp forms, not for GL2, but for GLN. And that's going to use something called Shimura varieties. So I said I'm not going to explain very much how to get the Galois representation rho f from f. But f is a holomorphic function on h with many symmetries. It can be reinterpreted as giving rise to a holomorphic differential on a quotient h modulo uh, this congruent subgroup gamma 0, 11. And so this is called the locally symmetric space. It's the locally symmetric space for the group SL2. So you can think of it as, so if you take the uh, group of isometries of h, that's SL2R, modulo the stabilizer of one point such as i, that would be modulo SO2I of r, and modulo gamma 0, 11. So it has this sort of structure where you can sort of interpret this as a locally symmetric space for the group SL2. But it has more than that. It has an algebraic structure. So in fact, yeah, this has a structure of an algebraic curve that's defined even over a uh, number field. Well, let's say Q or some extension. Um, all right. 
So generalizations of these things, you can think about locally symmetric spaces for any connected reductive group. And when those have an algebraic structure, you, um, you get Shimura varieties. So for example, if your group is GSP2G, then you can form locally symmetric spaces by taking double quotients um, in a similar fashion, and those um, end up having an algebraic structure because they're moduli of abelian varieties. So um, that's one example. Another example is unitary groups. Um, now, a non-example would be the case when you try to take GLN for n greater than 2. These would be locally symmetric spaces that don't have an algebraic structure. Or maybe if you took GL2 over E, where E is an imaginary quadratic field. Then you get arithmetic hyperbolic 3 manifold. Um, and being three manifolds, they don't have a complex structure and therefore can't have the structure of an algebraic variety. All right, so you can ask, well, you know, how, say, if you generalize modular forms to automorphic forms, you can ask about whether those automorphic forms contribute to the cohomology of these spaces, for example, to the cohomology of Shimura varieties. And it turns out that some very special um, cusp forms for GLN do contribute to the cohomology of compact unitary Shimura varieties. And somehow the generalization of the Ramanujan conjecture in um, this case, the Ramanujan Peterson conjecture, turns out to be closely related to the fact that these cusp forms contribute to cohomology in exactly one degree. In fact, contribute to cohomology in the middle degree. And so I'm going to take x over f to be a compact unitary Shimura variety. So a locally symmetric space attached to a unitary group, which has an algebraic structure and is defined over a number field, f. And maybe you know that these uh, quotients of the upper half plane are related to moduli spaces of elliptic curves. This is a moduli space of abelian varieties with extra structures. And you can look at the cohomology, so the et al cohomology, if you like, but you can also think of it roughly as a singular cohomology. And you can ask, you know, when do cusp forms for GLN contribute to this? And the answer is, so cusp forms contribute to this if star is equal to the dimension of x over 2. And it, this fact is closely related to the fact that cusp, these special cusp forms for GLN satisfy the Ramanujan conjecture. And so I'll just end with saying that um, in recent years, so what's been happening is that if you really want to understand the Langlands correspondence and you want to go in the other direction, so you want to start with the Galois representation and show that it comes from a modular form, then in higher dimensions, you need to take into account more than just this cohomology. You need to take into account the torsion cohomology. And so you can ask what happens with the torsion cohomology of these things. And we can take, so FP bar coefficients. And we have the following theorem. So this is joint work in progress with Peter Schulze. So if you take this, and so on this thing, you have a com large commutative algebra acting. It's called a Hecke algebra. And you understand classes in the cohomology of either of these spaces in terms of th this algebra, so by taking eigenvectors and thinking of them as systems of Hecke eigenvalues. And I'm going to localize at a maximal ideal corresponding to a specific system of Hecke eigenvalues. And I'm going to put a condition on this. I'm just going to call, it's a technical condition, but it's called sufficiently generic. And just the reason that I mention it is because sort of genericity is also key for proving Ramanujan, so for the characteristic, you know, understanding things in characteristic zero. So if you put such a condition on a mod p system of Hecke eigenvalues, then you get the same theorem. So this is equal to, is non-zero if, um, so, sorry only if, well, i 
is equal to the dimension of the space over 2. Um, OK, and I'll just end with saying that for now, so this result deals with compact unitary Shimura varieties. And one goal would be to understand what happens in the non-compact case, because in the non-compact case, the boundaries of these types of unitary Shimura varieties um, will see symmetric spaces for GLN or GL2E. So you can relate the boundary of those spaces to things that don't have an algebraic structure. Um, so one goal is to understand the non-compact case. Thank you.